Hi, I'm Bruce Mackay. I'm an internal medicine specialist at Veterinary Specialist Services. Today we're going to talk a little bit about meningitis. You and I have always wanted to think that this is really rare, but you know, it's nowhere near as rare as what we used to think. If you want to follow up on this, you can go to the Veterinary Resource Centre at vss.net.au and feel free to contact us anytime if you've got any questions about these, these topics. We, what we're going to do in this session is quickly run through Look a bit about meningitis. Is it really that uncommon? And if you'd asked me 20 years ago before I went into referral practice, 25 years ago, um, I would have said meningitis is as rare as hen's teeth. If you ask me now, um, I think meningitis is, is really common. Um, and you know, it's just one of those things that we've just got to be you know, aware of the whole, the whole time. So you know, what is meningitis? Meningitis by definition means in inflammation of the meninges. Um, if we've got inflammation of the meninges and the brain parenchyma, we've got meningoencephalitis. And then we characterise meningitis more based on the localization and the etiology. And you know, very broadly, we've got two groups etiology-wise. One is infectious, which you know, we, there's no doubt they're a lot less common, and there are a range of different infectious um, agents that we can have. And then there are these a lot more common groups of non-infectious uh, inflammatory meningitis, and these are your steroid-responsive meningitis, and you know, MUI meningitis of unknown origin, or you know, loosely GME, and then some of these breed-specific ones as well. So, you know, what age, what breed? Look, any age, any breed, but there's no, no doubt that meningitis is more common in young to middle-aged, smaller breed dogs. Um, but then we get the types of meningitis, you know, steroid-responsive meningitis arteritis, which is much more common in, in your medium and large breed dogs, so your beagles, boxes, and, and other large breeds. Um, the MUOs are you know, much more common in small breeds and you know, classically Maltese, but you know, any, any age, any breed. So how do these guys present to us in practice? Um, and so if we look at the group of you know, Maltese, other small breed dogs, we can have any neurological deficits at all. So some of these dogs come in with vestibular deficits, some come in blind, ataxic, um, gag deficits. Um, we can get anything at all depending on where the localization um, of the meningitis is. Classically, our steroid responsive meningitis, so these larger breed dogs, they tend to come in with fever, pain, and maybe neurological deficits. Uh, if we look at our angiostrongus, so our rat langworm, classically, this has been puppies with a progressive paresis yeah, marked spinal pain, droopy tail, maybe incontinent. Um, but we also recognise a group of um, adult dogs which can have all sorts of neurological deficits in, in dogs with angiostrongus as well. How do we diagnose meningitis? And so, yeah, to diagnose meningitis, we, we need to do a, a spinal tap. We need a CSF analysis. But you've got to have an index of suspicion first to make you want to go down that track. And so, yeah, have a good look at your signal, at your history, your physical exam. And then depending on the patient and sometimes on our CSF analysis as well, maybe we need advanced imaging. So CT or MR, um, depending on the CSF again, we might look at culture, serology, PCR. Um, and you know, some of these guys, you've also got to look at you know, background baseline, so CBC biochem, C-reactive protein, etc. So So just look at a couple of these specifically. So if we look at the meningitis of unknown origin, so yeah, you know, this was loosely called GME. Um, I think MUO is probably a better definition because you really can't get a definitive diagnosis without a biopsy, and we don't normally do that. And this little malt here, I guess, is the classic, and he's just got extreme vestibular disease. And yeah, you know, we had to really wind him down, keep him tranquilized or anesthetized for a few days. But we can get any urological deficits at all. So we can get seizures, we can get changes in demeanor, Vestibular changes, cerebellar signs, cranial nerve deficits. Some of these guys have back pain, some don't. Um, they can be paretic, and then they can be systemically unwell as well. So anorexia, fever, depression, lethargy. How do we treat them? You know, we need to treat these guys with immune suppressive drugs. Classically, we use steroids, prednisolone, two milligram a kilogram a day. You know, very slowly reducing the dose once they're in remission and slowly coming back further. And then we may or may not need other immunosuppressive medications like 
cytosine, cyclosporine, mycophenolate, depending on whether we're needing steroid sparing effects or whether we need to ramp up our treatment. And then maybe we need anti-epileptic drugs or other support if these guys are going to need hospitalizing. You know, some of them need analgesia, some need tranquilizing, some need feeding tubes. Steroid responsive meningitis, you know, again, we're normally talking young, middle-aged or middle to large breed dogs, so beagles, boxers, danes, uh, weimaranas, and classically these dogs will have fever, neck or back pain, they're systemically unwell, and they may have other neurological deficits as well. Treatment's pretty much the same, you know, we've got to use immune suppressive medications, plus or minus analgesia, plus or minus other support and and you know some of these dogs can have recurrences. Angiostrongolus, ketodensis, rat lungworm. And so you know we know the life cycle here where um, you know, it's, a, it's a rat lungworm, L1 excreted in the rat's feces and they get picked up um, as by incidental hosts by you know by puppies classically because the puppy is more likely to eat snails and slugs but it can be adult dogs and then the, the classic Human story is the is the drunk twenty year old male who's been dared by his mates to eat a slug or a snail, and there have been some tragic cases of that. So this is a Labrador puppy with you know pretty mild clinical signs, and he had a fever. He's got real back pain, which you'll you'll see when Nat palpates his back in a sec. You can see he's got a droopy tail. He had a fever, so you know we need to diagnose these you know with a with a spinal tap, and you know classically we're getting eosinophilic uh, pleocentosis and we treat them again with with prednisolone and there's great debate on the world of antihelmintics and antibiotics in these guys as well they certainly need pain relief and some of them need a lot of supportive care as well and again if you'd like to talk about these any further feel free to ring any of the the team at vss or feel free to send me an email thanks guys